Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining us from countries around the world. I'm Nader Habibi. On behalf of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University, I'd like to welcome you to our February Crown Center seminar titled A Stable Security, Bread and Wheat in Egypt, featuring Professor Jessica Barnes from University of South Carolina. Professor Barnes will be joining, joined by Professor Heather Sharkey as discussant for this seminar. Before I introduce our participants, a quick reminder that this seminar is being recorded and will be posted after the event on our YouTube channel. It will also become available on the event page of the Crown Center's website. In addition, if you have any questions for our guests at any point during the presentation and discussion, please type them in the Q&A box that will be available on the screen during the seminar. Now I will briefly introduce our seminar participants. Jessica Barnes received her PhD in Sustainable Development from Columbia University and is currently an associate professor in the Department of Geography at University of South Carolina. Her work examines the cultural, political, and material dimensions of resource use and environmental change in the Middle East and beyond. In addition to numerous articles in academic journals, Professor Barnes has published several books in this field. Her publications include Cultivating the Nile, the Everyday Politics of Water in Egypt, published by Duke University Press 2014, uh, Climate Cultures, Anthropological Perspectives on Climate Change, uh, published by Yale University Press 2015, and the book that would be the topic of our seminar today, a Stable Security, Bread and Wheat in Egypt, published by Duke University Press in 2022. Her research has been supported by grants from the American Council of, uh, Council of Learned Societies, National Science Foundation, and Wiener Gren Foundation. Our discussant, uh, Heather Sharkey is professor and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at University of Pennsylvania. Professor Sharkey specializes in the history of the modern Middle East and North Africa. At U of Penn, she teaches a popular seminar on the history of food in the Islamic Middle East. And since 2021, she has hosted an online series sponsored by her department titled Bite-Sized Talk, Middle Eastern Food and Food Ways Across History. Her books include Living with Colonialism, published by University of California Press 2003, American Evangelicals in Egypt, published by Princeton University Press 2008, a History of Muslims, Christians, and Jews in the Middle East, published by Cambridge University Press, 2017. In addition to authoring these books, Professor Sharkey uh, has edited and co-edited several books. Uh, her most recent uh, co-edited book is The Challenging Terrain of Religious Freedom, uh, which has been published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2021. Now, going back to her work on delicious Middle Eastern foods, she has an ongoing project as editor of a book series for Edinburgh University Press called Food and Foodways in the Middle East, North Africa, and their diasporas. Okay, so we will start this seminar with Jessica, who will give us uh, a seven to 10 minute overview of her project on the significance of bread and wheat in Egyptian society. 
This will be followed by a 30 minute discussion about this topic between Jessica and Heather. Then at 11.45, Heather will lead us through a 30 minute question and answer session uh, with your questions. So if you have any questions, please type them uh, in the Q&A box that will be available on the screen. Uh, and we will wrap up the seminar promptly at uh, 12.15. So Jessica, please start. Great, well, thank you so much, Nada, for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to be part um, of this seminar series. I'm really thrilled to be with you all today. Um, and a particular thank you to um, Heather for uh, taking the time to read read this book and um, and engage with it. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. When Egyptian protesters took to the streets in January 2011, they called for bread, freedom, and social justice. Now, bread here was in part symbolic, a reference to livelihoods, to people's frustrations at their inability to build a decent life for themselves. But it was also literal. Some protesters carried loaves of bread in their hands. Others fashioned helmets out of bread. They were calling for bread because bread is a food that most Egyptians eat every day, three times a day. They were calling for bread because the years prior had seen severe shortages in the supply of the very widely eaten government subsidized bread and complaints about its declining quality. And to the protesters, these deficiencies were really emblematic of the Mubarak regime's shortcomings. As a staple food, bread is fundamentally tied to the staple crop from which it's made, wheat. Uh, Egypt grows a lot of wheat, mostly on small scale farms, a couple of acres or so in size. But Egyptian farmers don't grow enough to meet their country's very high demand for bread. Um, and so about half the wheat is imported. To Egyptians, the possibility that their nation could run out of wheat or that they might not have enough decent bread to eat is an existential threat. It's a threat to the well-being of Egypt's poor, for whom uh, cheap bread constitutes a major portion of their caloric intake, and it's a threat to the stability of the state. History has shown how people don't sit idly by when they don't have good bread to eat. In my book, I introduce the concept of staple security to describe the practices through which people seek to counter this threat and ensure the continuous supply of a quality staple, both on the level of the nation and on the level of an individual, individual household. And to take each part of this uh, concept in turn, by staple, what I mean is a food that defines a meal. A staple is a food that if it's not on the table, people don't feel like they've properly eat, eaten. I remember back in 2008, which was a time when there were severe bread shortages in Egypt. I talked with one man who told me how he'd been to the bakery that morning and he hadn't been able to get any bread. And he said to me, I couldn't bring bread for my children today. They won't have anything to eat. But by this, he wasn't meaning literally that his children wouldn't eat anything all day, but rather that without bread, they wouldn't be properly nourished. As one of my Egyptian friends once commented to me, it's impossible to last a day without bread. Bread is something fundamental. So staple security brings together this particular kind of food with the notion of security, um, an idea long theorized by political scientists, but recently taken up more broadly by anthropologists and geographers. And this work has expanded conceptualizations of security beyond the kinds of things we might typically think about, like policing national borders um, or maintaining stability, to really consider about how security infuses individuals' daily lives. So in this definition by Gluck and Lowe, they define security as a modality of constructing danger, enemies, fear, and anxiety, and the measures taken to guard against such constructive threats. And what I like about this definition is that it points to these sort of two dimensions to security. On the one hand, you have the affective, the emotional, the emotional dimension, um, you know, the, the, the lived experience of fear and anxiety. And then on the other hand, you have the actions that people are taking to ensure that they, that they sort of to address those perceived threats. Um, and obviously, these two dimensions are interlinked. So 
Actions may lead to a momentary sense of security in which those feelings of anxiety give way to feelings of, of comfort and reassurance, um, but the threat is ever present. I introduced this concept of stable security as a deliberate point of departure from the concept of food security. And this is because I see food security as being rooted in a very particular kind of history of international conferences and negotiated definitions and policy approaches. Um, uh, sort of definitions like this one here, which is actually quite old now, back from 2001, but is still very commonly cited. And one of the things I found striking about uh, this work is that despite the inclusion of the word security within the term, explorations of security itself have been remarkably absent. Food security tells us little about the deep anxieties that surround efforts to obtain particular foods or what might happen in their absence. This kind of bland definition about people being able to access food stands in stark contrast with that square in downtown Cairo thronging with protesters. Food security also isn't very helpful for thinking about staples specifically, even though actually staple grains were the focus of much of the early work in this field. As you can see from this definition, nutritional balance is now a key part of how scholars think about food security. So you can't be food secure just from eating bread. Um, and this was really brought home to me during my research, where I found that all the people um, working on food security issues in Egypt never mentioned bread, except to sometimes say how they thought that Egyptians ate too much bread. And all the people working on bread and wheat issues in Egypt never framed their work in terms of food security. So there's this kind of disconnect between how people experience security related to particular foods and how policy scholars think about food security. Um, so staple security allows me to kind of move beyond this, to think, uh, move beyond this work on food security, to really consider the nexus of food and security. Um, it focuses attention on staple foods because staple foods are really unlike others in their existential importance, um, both to people's daily lives and the legitimacy of the state. This is why their absence or their substandard quality poses such an existential threat. Now, of course, this is a constructive threat. Um, it's possible to live without bread. Uh, but as we all know, sort of security isn't necessarily really about the assessment of real dangers. It's an imaginary. The affective dimension, the kind of emotional dimension of staple security, um, therefore captures both a political leader's fear of the bread riot and that kind of unsettled feeling a parent might have if there's no bread left in the home. It also captures some of these other forms of affect, um, the, the, the pleasure of eating a meal with freshly baked bread or the yearning for breads that taste of rural childhoods. In other words, people really care what this bread tastes like. The other dimension of staple security are these concrete actions through which people seek to secure the presence of a tasty staple. So these range from the government, government's operation of a huge subsidized bread program um, to small individual acts within homes, like the how people handle leftover le loaves at the end of a meal. In terms of the kind of data I'm drawing on, um, this book is based on ethnographic fieldwork that I've conducted in Egypt since 2007, uh, primarily in the rural province of Fayoum, a couple of hours um, southwest of Cairo, um, as well as interviews, um, archival research and analysis of Arabic language newspapers. Um, it also dra draws on ethnographic research that I conducted uh, in collaboration, or I did in collaboration with the research assistant, Miriam Tahar, um, at bakeries in Cairo in 2015 through 2017. So the structure of the book follows wheat uh, from its seed through its cultivation and trade to its transformation into different kinds of bread. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different dimensions in the book, and I'd be happy to talk about any of these in the Q&A. You know, it really takes us from sort of questions of seed breeding to some of the questions around farmers' livelihoods as they grow wheat, um, to questions around the importing of wheat and some of the trade regulations, the quality controls around grain and the infrastructures that are required to store this grain. Um, and then looks um, sort of broadly at both the subsidized bread and then at some, some of the different kinds of homemade bread that are, are eaten in Egypt. And 
sort of across these um, chapters, we sort of see the labor of the policymakers who are the kind of people we might often think about as those who kind of have security as their domain. Um, but we also see the sort of less visible security labors of crop scientists um, working in experimental fields, women preparing bread for a meal, or men going to a bakery. I bring together these scales and sites because it's through these everyday practices taking place in fields, at ports, in silos, bakeries, and within the home, that the feeling of security reaches the bellies of the Egyptian people. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I think I can start now with uh, our conversation. And I want to say first that I didn't just read this book because you all invited me at Brandeis to come and be the discuss. And I'd read it beforehand because, uh, and I've also assigned part of it in class. So I was really delighted to have the opportunity to talk about this book, which I love. And I'll try to also bring out why I love it, but it just focuses on bread from so many different angles and shows its relevance to so many spheres of history and politics and cultural life in Egypt, that it's a really uh, vivid and creative and, um, and helpful study for understanding Egypt today. I also just want to say that, you know, um, Jessica emphasized this idea of the existential threat or concerns about lack of access to bread and I mentioned to her that a colleague of mine at Penn, who's an Egyptologist, told me about this book by Coralie Schweckler in French on the names of bread in ancient Egypt. It's an entire study about all the words for bread that appear. And the opening pages have a claim in it that really sounds like it could come from Jessica's book. Uh, the author notes that the preoccupation with food in general and bread in particular is a constant in funerary sources from ancient Egypt. They reproduce an unease which finds its roots, and I'm translating from the French here, um, in the world of the living where famine threatened people whenever there was a fear of a lack of access to cereal and bread. So these concerns of the ancient Egyptians, you can actually see echoed in um, Jessica's book, a lot of the same kinds of concerns and a lot of the pictures, which I hadn't realized were bread, you know, when we look at pictures of uh, hieroglyphics, I hadn't realized that those were bread words that we were looking at. So anyway, I just was really struck by the continuing parallels with that. And also with what, um, how Jessica de defines a staple, she mentioned the existential importance, but also the symbolic resonance. That's a phrase she uses in the book for, um, um, explaining the 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 tremendous importance of bread in political and social discourses in Egypt. So I, I actually have two main questions for uh, Jessica and to get our, our conversation going. And then at 1145, we will um, open it up to um, the questions from the audience at large. But my first question that I was really struck by was on page uh, 43 of the book, Jessica discusses um, the idea of bread as something that, or wheat rather in Egypt that is undergoing a process of becoming. And I'll, I'll just read you um, the, a little bit of the paragraph and, and maybe Jessica, if you could talk us through this some more. Um, she explains in one of the chapters how she tells the story of how the wheat and bread that we see in Egypt today have come into being. While this story is one that began thousands of years ago, I focus on changes over the 20th century and to the present. And she cites scholars in, who wrote a book called Ingrained, um, who challenge the idea that wheat's character and identity are fixed, arguing that wheat is in a constant process of becoming and how it's changed over time. And she goes on to discuss um, interventions by organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, the US Department of Agriculture, and um, the FAO affecting what Egyptians have grown and and how they regard wheat. So I'm wondering, could you um, tell us what you mean about that idea of wheat as something that is becoming in a process of becoming and how we see that playing out in Egypt over the last um, century or so? Uh, 
Yeah, thank you. So this is one of the slightly more, um, this is one of the sections of the book that draws on some archival work that I did um, that was really trying to trace, um, you know, how we've got to the place where the, what varieties are being, what kinds of seeds are being grown in Egypt today. Um, when I spoke with crop scientists in Egypt about what varieties um, are being um are being grown, they told me that basically there are no land races. These are the kind of more traditional varieties at all being grown in Egypt today. It's all what are known as modern varieties. And so I was kind of curious about that. How have we got to that position? Um, and so this chapter really sort of traces some of that work of breeding these new varieties. And one of the things it does is pulls out some of this kind of security rhetoric that was actually really underpinning those efforts. Um, so you know, particularly in the 50s and the 60s, you have a lot of crop scientists that are talking about, you know, needing to develop new varieties of wheat that are high yielding, that are resistant to diseases, because we need to produce enough wheat for our population. And because we need to, you know, what about if there was a, a disease epidemic that wiped out our crops? So you see this kind of security language, this notion of threats quite explicitly in those sources. Um, so that was one of the things um, I wanted to kind of draw out. And there is this very interesting kind of international history of crop breeding um, also that kind of plays into that that um, that process. So, you know, a lot of these, you know, modern varieties were developed in collaboration with this Rockefeller Foundation funded initiative based in Mexico. Um, some people might have heard of Norman Borlaug, a very famous uh, crop scientist who led up that program and who who really led a lot of that work to develop these high yielding varieties. But I, what I wanted to also draw out in that chapter was the work of the Egyptian scientists. So a lot of a number of Egyptians went to Mexico to be trained. They sometimes brought back seeds in their luggage. They certainly brought back a lot of different kinds of knowledge and ideas. Um, and I wanted to bring some of those voices into this story, too, because it's certainly not a simple story of kind of U.S. scientists imposing something on Egypt. Um, this was definitely something that was a kind of collaboration and that the work of these Egyptian scientists was really pivotal to um, the development of those varieties. You know, another interesting thing, I think, in that chapter is that often the stories that are told in the kind of critical social science literature of the Green Revolution, of this development of these new varieties, have a kind of slightly negative tenor. You know, we, we know quite well that there have been a number of problematic issues around some of these modern varieties. But I'm not sure that the Egyptian case really, I think actually the Egyptian case is a slightly different one uh, for a number of reasons that perhaps I don't, don't need to go into right now. But, um, you, you know, to me, it doesn't seem a simple case of uh, a sort of negative story of these new varieties coming in and displacing, uh, you know, a lot of people have benefited from much higher yields. And yes, they have increased their fertilizer usage, but, um, you know, a farmer growing from being able to, you know, two tons per hectare to over six that's a that's really sort of been a quite a transformation for both for farmers and for the for the state as well. So yeah, in that chapter, one of the things that I like, it actually reminds me of the book by Diana Davis on trees in Algeria. And it I feel that that chapter is the one in your book that has the most a uh, kind of history of science angle to it as well, which underscores the interdisciplinary uh, nature of your study. One of the things just to follow up on that that I've wondered about with the, the wheat, the history of the wheat, is indeed the Mexico connection, which is very interesting, the emphasis on higher yields. But now I've been seeing murmurs starting to appear in discussions of wheat and bread in other places, for example, in Turkey, about concerns over water use. Um, so that was the emphasis on higher yield wheat crops that maybe didn't take into account as much drought tolerance and other water related issues. So that's something that strikes me as interesting. I just realized I wanted to show everybody I have a show and tell. I was telling Jessica, I'm an avid bread baker. And for my students at Penn this week, I got hold of emmer and einkorn wheat, two of the ancient Near Eastern founder crop wheats, which are grown on a very small scale now in Pennsylvania. And so I made, um, this one is einkorn wheat bread and this one is emmer wheat bread. And I think this would have been theoretically, the, some of the varieties that people were baking bread from in Egypt before um, these, on the onset of these, you know, mid 20th century Mexican varieties. So anyway, just wanted to yeah, show. Yeah, very interesting. Do they taste nice? 
they're great. They're <laughs> really nice and very chewy and uh, it's, they feel beautiful to work with. So I would recommend it to anybody to try. It's a lot of fun too, when you feel you're using an ancient wheat, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so these are, uh, the, the book, when I'm looking at these development varieties, it's new varieties of bread wheat I'm looking at primarily. Um, there was also some work on Durham. So there is that longer history, like you said, of, you know, in pharaonic times, things like Emma and einkorn were kind of more common uh, but but the even the the traditional varieties of, of wheat that were being growing at the start of the 20th century were mostly bread wheat so it's not a kind of replacement of one with the other it's just different varieties of that species of wheat oh that's that's yeah. cool did not know that that's really neat um another you know big question i'm sure a lot of people have this in their mind um is with regard to the you know, the situation in Egypt today, rising prices and growing anxiety over access to bread and the sec food, bread staple security, as you would say. So um, could you tell us your views on the thought of the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war on Egypt, the bread and wheat situation uh, coming out of COVID did not make it easy, mm. you know, complicated yeah. things even more. And I believe, and I was looking at the statistics this morning, I think Egypt is the largest importer of wheat in the world. And it's, as I you note in the book, I think it's the largest consumer of bread in the world, if you look at a per capita consumption rates. So yeah, what are your thoughts on the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war and COVID and where things stand now with a bread in Egypt? Yeah, Um I mean, the, the immediate concern when the war broke out, because as probably many participants know, you know, uh, Russia and Ukraine are made, two of the largest exporters of wheat in the world. Um, the immediate concern when the war broke out was that there would be a, a real uh, disruption in the supply of grain. And, and indeed, there was a little, you know, some disruption through the Black Sea. Um, but the, the biggest concerns about that, that being completely kind of cut off haven't really borne fruit. But what we have seen over the last kind of couple of years has been, um, you know, spiraling prices for grain, you know, which are, are tied to the conflict. Um, so that has had a severe impact on Egypt um, in the, the, the increasing wheat cross costs because they are such a larger, large importer of wheat. And as I said, about half their wheat has to be imported. So when well prices go up, that really puts a lot of pressure on the government. Um, again, they haven't sort of run out of wheat. They haven't depleted their stocks, largely because they've received some international assistance from the World Bank, from the African Development Bank to help finance those, um, those imports. Uh, but it's put a lot of pressure on the on the government. And as you said, the, you know, the, there has been a lot of it's been a real source of stress and tension, you know, partly because there's a huge foreign currency shortage as well in Egypt at the moment, which is tied to uh, uh, COVID. It's tied to the Ukraine war and the sort of disruption of tourism from Russia. Um, so, yes, that it's been a, a sort of a big source of stress and and um, tension in Egypt. But I think the very fact that they have not seen a disruption to their supply, that they've managed to maintain enough wheat, that there hasn't been shortages in bread, really speaks to some of those themes I'm trying to talk about in the book about how, just how important bread is. And so with the kind of broader economic crisis in Egypt, you know, the, the Egyptian government has been cutting back in all sorts of places. They've been cutting back gas subsidies, they've been cutting back, you know, uh, other prices have been spiraling, but bread is the one thing where um, they have not made any changes. And this is despite just prior to this kind of the, the Ukraine war, President Sisi had made some some comments about kind of possibly considering changing the bread price um, at some point. But that has they haven't taken any action on that. And I think it is because, um, you know, at a time when really many Egyptians can't, there's so much they can't afford. There's, you know, and food is so expensive that, that at least they have bread to eat. And do you think that, you know, I've I've seen some commentators say, oh, it's unsustainable for Egypt to continue to subsidize bread to the extent that it does. Uh, do you do you sense that at all? I mean, and if anything, I've also seen that there's been an expansion of increasing access to subsidized bread for a broader range of Egyptians. Do you sense any kind of change there or do you uh, have thoughts on that? discourse about, oh, they need to cut back or it's not sustainable or whatnot? I mean, international experts and economists have been saying that Egypt needs to cut back its bread subsidy for decades. 
And, you know, what I think when I hear those comments is, you know, I think that they haven't seen a family of eight sit down for a meal that's basically bread with a few olives and a small plate of cheese. You know, there's, um, it, it is providing such a, a huge social support. So I think it would be very difficult and politically contentious for them to cut back that subsidy. Now, that doesn't mean they're not making certain cuts, but they're going about them in a very kind of clever way. One of one of the things I chart in that chat, same chapter where I sort of look about how a bit how the subsidized bread has changed over the years. And although they haven't changed the price of bread, they've actually made it a bit smaller. Um, so that is in effect, you're increasing the price, but but it doesn't carry the same kind of political weight as saying suddenly the bread is going to go up from five piastres to more. So they have cut, made cuts in that way. Um, and then actually they have been trying to reduce the number of people who can get this subsidy in the last, uh, over the last kind of five to 10 years. So they introduced this new system, a whole new system of managing the subsidy where they have an electronic smart card. So you need to have an electronic card to get access to bread there's a limit on how much you can get. You can get five loaves a day per person. And there's also an incentive for you not to get all that bread unless you really need it. Um, because if you don't get all that bread, you can exchange any points that you haven't used for other subsidized goods. So they have been, and then since they introduced the ration card, they have been tightening up the criteria a little bit for who can have access to a ration card as a way of trying to, to reduce the number of beneficiaries. But it's very... Um, it's it's very small steps, I think, because of the kind of political, uh, you, you know, because of the political stakes, really. And have you seen much evidence of wastage? In your book, you mentioned that, I think at some point, uh, people, because they revere and respect bread, that there isn't the kind, people find ways to, re to use leftovers, for example. Um, so do you sense much wastage as a fact we hear about waste a lot in the united states for mm. example but do you see that in egypt with the bread i mean historically that has been actually quite a common trope from experts um various international and egyptian experts have said you know because bread is so cheap people the egyptians you know are, are wasting it and uh you know they're not dealing with it carefully and this is a function of it being so cheap and a very common thing you hear is um you know, people were feeding their their bread to their livestock. Now, actually, if you consider that a waste or not, I think it depends a bit on your perspective, because if you're then going to eat your livestock, your chickens, or you're going to eat your eggs from your chickens, then to me, that's not necessarily a waste. But, you you know, you can appreciate how to the government subsidising bread, you might perceive it in that way. Um, but no, I think you, you commonly hear people talking about wastage. I, I think that's why introducing that limit on how many bread and the incentive not to not to get the bread unless you really want it has probably kind of cut down on that a little bit. But from my field work, I really saw very little, very little wastage. Um, and, you know, in the, the chapter where I talk about sort of some of the bread practices within the home in Egypt, in rural Egypt, you know, I talk about how you know, people are actually very careful, you know, even sort of segments of bread, they'll dust off. This, this is poorer rural families, you know, they'll they'll dust off remaining segments and kind of put them back in the pile so they can eat them at the next meal. You know, I definitely didn't see any kind of haphazard sort of, let's just throw it away if we've sort of started it or it's, it's got a bit stale. Oh, and also these different kind of practices around preserving the bread. So you're freezing it or drying it as a way to kind of make sure it doesn't mold so you can use it. Yeah, in your, I think it's in chapter four, one of the things that mesmerized me in your descriptions, which I really loved, is how you describe how people would go and buy, stand in line to buy their bread, and they would be very particular about which loaves they got, if there were like burn spots on some of the bread, or if the shape was appropriate, and they would say, you describe, oh no, I want, can I have that loaf instead of this loaf? And then they would wrap it up. You have a long discussion of how people wrap it up. So it really seems like, you know, the, the the picture that you draw in the book is of people really respecting the bread a lot, which goes back to your idea of it as a staple that holds symbolic resonance. Uh, it's I, I, You don't get the sense from your book that people are taking it for granted. There's this, you, you manage to convey this sense of deep appreciation. And they're also in appreciating the taste and, you know, the gustatory experience of it. But there, there's gratitude and appreciation and respect that comes through your discussion. 
Yeah, yeah. And we, we really wanted to, and um, that's in the chapter that I sort of co-authored with Miriam and wanted to kind of highlight some of these everyday practices around bread at the bakery and, you know, that that uh, the concern about which which loaves you took home and carefully kind of wrapping them or making sure that they're cool before you wrap them so they don't get all sweaty. Yeah, because I think sometimes when we think about, um, you know, recipients of government subsidies or recipients of food subsidies, you know, there, there can be in certain in certain fora, there can be a tendency to either perceive those recipients as kind of passive recipients of the kind of what the government's given them or to think that they don't care very much about you know they, they just want their cheap bread and and I really wanted to we really wanted to challenge that because people do care a lot and they are actually you know if they didn't do these practices then actually their bread wouldn't taste very nice and and there would be some, probably some disquiet yeah, and that's why when you mention the claim of some of the, you know, the um, NGO type or, you know, aid development type people who say, oh, Egyptians eat too much bread, that just doesn't ring true after reading your book, by the way. I mean, they may eat a lot of it, but not too much. Um, so I think that also, yeah, goes back to some of these other points that you've raised. I have one more question because I see a lot of exciting comments and questions starting to come up in the, the chat and the Q&A. And I, I wanted to ask you, going back to this idea of staple security as this as a concept, which we can, I think, apply to other places, whether you now see parallels with other parts of the world or, play, or could you suggest to us places where we could look to apply this concept, whether to bread or, or something else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I see a lot of parallels. I try and draw these out sort of in, a bit in sort of the end of the book. Um, there are a lot of parallels with um, rice in a number of Asian countries, for example, uh, maize uh, in, you know, in, in there are many parallels with other places, I think, around different staples. But you see similar kind of concerns about stocks, similar concerns about running out, similar concerns about the quality of the food. Um and, and then, you know, across different countries of the Middle East, given the audience, um, you know, I'm sure many people will who who live or work in other parts of the Middle East who are on this webinar will have seen, you know, sort of other parallels um, with other parts of the region. Um, maybe people are familiar with Jose Martinez's book, States of Subsistence, um, which just came out about bread in Jordan. A lot of really interesting parallels and, and, you know, some differences in the kind of nitty gritty of the how the subsidies work or how the, you know, obviously Jordan isn't nearly such a big uh, agricultural producer as Egypt, very different population size, but some also some real sort of interesting parallels there. Um, Yes, and as someone, you know, as um, uh, Nada said in his uh, introduction, you know, my first work was actually about water. So I think we could also actually see there are some interesting parallels with other kinds of resources as well, which are also kind of fulfill staple needs. And I think water would be one example of that. Um, you know, it, with the Nile, which was the focus of my first book, there's similarly kind of a concern about relying on water that comes from outside your country, from the Nile that comes from sort of East Africa. There's similar concern about wanting to store that water within your borders. Um, and having the infrastructure to do so. So yes, I think there are, um, I hope that the, the concept might be of use for thinking about some other kinds of both staple things and then staple foods in other parts of the world. Um, so I think now what I propose we do is transition to a few of the questions that are coming up because they form a natural continuation of, of our conversation. And there are three and they're a little bit overlapping. And so I think I'll try to bring them together for you from Reem Talhuk, Reli Schechter, and also um, Nadia El Dakruri. And um, Nadia and uh, Reem have quest a quest overlapping question about the extent to which you would see um, the Egyptian government, in a sense, buying um, um ensuring social stability, uh, using bread as a means of ensuring social stability, uh, how important that is politically, whether you see any changes in light of you know, extreme price fluctuations that we're observing in Egypt today. So in other words, how important is bread to political stability in Egypt today? And then there's also a, a related question, how did people react or adapt to the current recent changes, including the new ration cards. So maybe how about if we start with that question about the views on political stability and uh, the social contract with bread? 
Yeah. I mean, I think it really is very important. You know, I think um, I think the fact that, you know, the government has, I think it's telling where the government has cut back in these like extremely difficult economic circumstances. To me, it's telling that they've raised, they've reduced their subsidies on gas, you know, but that, but not on, not on bread. And that's despite kind of considerable pressure to do so. You know, the media reports said that when the IMF loan was getting negotiated a couple of years back, that there was real pressure to try and get them to re reduce the bread subsidy. And that was one thing they weren't willing to do. Um, so I think it's very important. And I, you know, it was no striking to me how often people, uh, whether it was uh, people who worked in policy fields or in the international kind of expertise, international donor space in Cairo, how often they talked about the bread riots of the past. Um, now, you know, it's particularly these bread riots that happened in 1977. Now, those riots weren't just about bread. They were actually, you know, that was a time when they also were cutting back other subsidies. They were reducing public sector work, public sector wages. But they are, the common moniker of the bread riot is the one that's sort of used to refer to still those riots. And, you know, I think the fact that people still refer back to these riots so much kind of is also speaking to this sense of concern that if there was a, if there was a some problem with the bread supply or there were bread, uh, you know, either or the price became much higher, that there is a real concern that people that could be a source of civil unrest. Actually, that ties it. What you said ties into something that Andrew Simon brought up in the Q and A. So I'll just draw this out a little bit more before um, going back to the a couple of the other questions. But do you indeed hear a lot of people? Did do, the people you spoke to did they talk a lot about the nineteen seventy seven bread riots in the Sadat era? To what extent did you get a sense that? the attitudes towards those bread riots were inf continuing to inform political discourses? Or did you even get a sense that they were aware of a longer, even longer, deeper history of um, political activism or agitation relative to bread? Yeah. I mean, it depended on which people I was talking to. So my neighbours in the village in Fayoum, who I've known for a long time, you know, the the, fa the farming families that I've known for a long time, I don't think I ever heard them reference bread riots. But almost every interview I did, whether it was with someone who worked for the Ministry of Agriculture or in food security or for, you know, an international donor project, almost everyone who was working in that space, kind of really thinking about the national level, kind of wheat supply, bread supply, almost all of them referenced it. So I think it definitely looms large. Um, and it's referenced very frequently by journalists in articles. Um, it's often used as a kind of uh, an entry point to um, to discussions about bread. So, yes, I think it it definitely looms large in ways that actually kind of paper over actually some slight inaccuracies, because often it's talked about in the 1970s when the government tried to raise the price of bread. They did. But actually, it was only the price of fino, which is a kind of white, a soft white roll. It, they didn't try and raise the price of the, the baladi bread, the kind of round um dark pisher bread. So people often kind of don't give that nuance or that sort of detail um, when they report it. Um, but I think it, it's more, you know, the truth of the whether or not these were really bread riots is, is of less relevance, I think, than the fact that how often they are evoked. Um, so yeah, your comment there, in a way, ties into Relly Schechter's question. Um, he asked, how do different social classes evaluate bread could you suggest a social hierarchy of bread based on price, quality, and taste? And why I think it relates to what you just said, if I'm remembering from your book, you were discussing, when you mentioned the fino bread, a, a different type, and then uh, you, there was a different pricing structure applied to that. And I think towards the very end of your book as well, you mentioned at some point how the people you were talking to in Cairo and in, in more, I, I forget what the discussion, like in more affluent neighborhoods, were um, lamenting what they saw as the decline of the rural bread culture. People are lo losing a knowledge of how to make bread. Uh, they're losing, you know, we used to have so many different kinds of bread and now there are just a few. And I think that th their comments tie into this question about social class and bread. So could you, and yet at the same time, the, the wealthy people that you might've been meeting who aren't reliant on the bread subsidies, share the same 
emotive um, attachment, some existential attachment to bread that you're describing for all Egyptians. So that seems to be something they have in common. Could you talk us through that, the social class dynamics of bread and the idea of hierarchies based on price, quality, and taste? Yeah. Um, I mean, so there is definitely a sort of class dimension to it, um, you know, because this Valadie bread, the the one, the subsidized bread is so much, it's so much cheaper than any other breads that are available on the market. Um, and even more so since the price inflation. Um, so, uh, but, you know, in Egypt, you have a situation where the vast majority of the population is poor, uh, you know, so it, it's, um, so, you know, it's, it, so, you know, so poor or they're in the kind of lower middle class and vulnerable to kind of falling into poverty. So, yes, it, it, it has a class dimension, but we're still really talking about the majority of people are eating um, this subsidized bread. You know, maybe 60, 70 percent of the population. It's very difficult to kind of get figures on that. Um, so there are these other kinds of bread available on the market that are unsubsidized um, and even Poor people will eat those breads sometimes, you know, they might eat them for certain purposes, they might buy those fino loaves, the kind of soft white rolls to make a sandwich for their kids to take to school, or they might sometimes, you know, some people might prefer the whiter, the slightly whiter bread. Um, but but that's it's definitely there's a only people with a little more means are able to afford a, a much more expensive, you know, bread that might be, uh, I mean, I, it's been a while since I knew the prices, but you know, but last time I knew, you know, a single loaf of one of those other kinds of bread was over a, an Egyptian pound. So way, way more expensive than that five piastre loaf. Um, so there's a huge, a huge difference there. Um, another class I mentioned that, you, you know, there is some difference in sort of what staples people are reliant on across part, across class. So sometimes, you know, you might find around more elite members of society they still eat bread and like you say, it still has a kind of symbolic resonance to them, but they have the means that they can also eat rice and other kinds of staples, which not all, um, which are typically a bit more expensive and, and aren't kind of within reach for other members of the society. So, so there are differences as well as kind of similarities across class. Um, this also relates to a question that Alan Benjamin raised about uh, he asked, uh, the, could you describe the common form or shape and contents of most Egyptian breads? Are the bread loaves flat, uh, round, et cetera? And what substances in addition to grains are used to bake breads? And you do discuss that at, uh, at one point in the book. But in addition to that, if I could also um, add on top of this question from Alan, do you sense from the aid people and the other uh, policy, food policy people, that they have a sense that certain kinds of bread are more healthy than others, the, like the fino versus the baladi bread, and how that also then relates to the class dynamics. So anyway, so that's sort of on top of this question about the nature of the breads and the varieties, and what in addition to, I guess, wheat would pe might people use to bake them? So the, the dominant bread's being baked in Egypt today. So the, the, the subsized bread is wheat flour, yeast, water, and salt. So it's very basic and, and not sourdough, like an instant yeast. Uh, so it's a very, um, and many of the other breads, not all of them, but many of the other breads have basically those same core ingredients. So some, you know, some regional breads, you know, they might add some fenugreek. There's one that has a bit of fenugreek. The, the fino rolls have a little bit of sugar in them, um, but there's not a huge variation. Where you see the biggest variation is actually the kind of flour that's used in terms of how white or dark it is. So the Valadi bread is made with quite a dark flour and not very refined flour. Um, whereas a lot of, most of the other unsubsidized breads are whiter. Um, and so that raises some interesting questions of health. Um, you know, I think that's a slippery, probably there are different perspectives on what comprises a health, healthy bread and also interesting sort of relations between health and taste. Um, but people will often talk about the Valadi bread, the subsidized bread as being healthy. And I think that's partly because um, it's with this darker bread. Uh, they also add a bit of bran, a bit of extra, extra bran to the bread. So it, it's in some ways uh, an inversion for what we see around class and bread in, say, the United States, you know, in terms of what are the cheaper breads and, which, you know, often it's the cheaper breads and whiter breads, whiter, more industrially produced breads in the US than the darker wholemeal loaves. So it's kind of an interesting inversion of that. Um, 
Amy Singer asks, what do people who claim Egyptians eat too much bread imagine will replace bread as a staple? <laughs> I'm actually, when I was reading your book, I was wondering about potatoes because my sense um, from Jordan is that people are eating more French fries, which isn't necessarily a good thing, uh, yeah. but potatoes in some places seem to be taking over or, you know, in fast food cultures in the Gulf states, for example, you know, you know, the rise of, of fast food culture. So yeah, any sense about what, when they say that, what do they really think? Do they think people should be eating more rice uh, or, or what? I think they're probably thinking, and, you know, I suppose we had Egypt, there are serious problems with obesity in Egypt, as in many countries of the world. So there are problems with overnutrition. And so, you know, that's where they're coming from, these nutritionists who are concerned about the kind of consumption of this calorie rich food. I mean, I think what they're hoping is that, you know, the proportion of wheat to other things, the proportion of bread to other things on the plate would be would be changed. So, you know, less bread and more salad and protein. But, you know, of course, those things are all more expensive. So um, I don't think they really think through those those lines of thought. That's my perspective They they're quicker to say, you know, they eat too much bread. Um, in terms of potatoes, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, the, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of different potato dishes that would be eaten with bread. So I guess I don't see it as a substitution. You know, often, you know, you might have a sandwich that would have fries in it, but it would also be wrapped in bread. Or, you know, in rural areas in Egypt, they often make like a tomato and, and potato stew, um, but it would be eaten with bread. Um, so... I don't see it, you know, I, I don't think um, in the near future, I can't really envisage, you know, shifts. But, you know, I'm not talking about cultures. I'm also wary that, you know, I'm not saying that things are, are static. And certainly we do see in other places, you know, different staple preferences changing for a number of reasons. So it could work. Things could change down the line. But um, in the near future, I, I would be surprised to see that. Um, Ian Vandermullen asks a question of, about your idea of uh, security and the different scales from family community to nation and writes that the definition of your of security that we're working with reminds um, him of the, some of Stuart Hall's earlier work on moral panics, where social problems are, are constructed with, within elite discourse as justification for certain securitization policies. And here's the question. But with bread, the security issue seems particularly palpable at a more individual or at least fam familial level. So are there differences between the general public and state authorities or other political elites on what the problem actually is? I guess that goes, you know, when you were discussing security, there's the, the feeling, the feeling of fear, and then there's the measures, the stuff that you do. So another way of putting this question are, are there, is there also a differences in what the state is doing versus the strategies that um, individuals and uh, families may be pursuing. But yeah, so yeah, moral panics, differences between state and ordinary yeah. Egyptians. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to bring these together partly, I mean, that's just a sort of feature of my work. I'm really interested in sort of thinking across scale and, and you know, something I did in my first book, trying to kind of link households with what's going on at the national level, thinking kind of globally as well. Uh, and I think, um, you know, as I developed this concept of stable security, I could really see it. It didn't feel like a force to see it at these different scales. However, just as these two questions kind of highlighted, you know, what exactly it is, is a bit different. So, uh, you know, how it's articulated, just like um, Ian in the question posed, you know, what the, the root of the problem is. Yes, it's, it's quite different across those different scales. And sometimes these interests actually uh, don't align. Uh, so in my chapter about growing wheat, I talk about how it's in the kind of government's interest to um, to have lots of Egyptian, to have Egyptian farmers continue to plant wheat, which they almost all do. But also, more particularly, they really want farmers to sell their wheat to the government so that the government gets a lot of that harvest. Um, but but then I look at from the kind of farmer's perspective, most of them are growing wheat. You know, they, they, they want to sell it if they have some extra, but many of them are growing it really so they have enough grain within the home that they can bake their own bread. So you see to them security as having sacks of grain in their, in their own living room that they can then bake with for the rest of the year to a farming household. That's what security is. To the government, it's having that grain in the government silos so they can make subsidized bread. So that there are some of these interesting kind of 
connections, but also sort of disjunctures or, or like points of conflict between the scales. Thank you. Um, Jamie Fico asks a question about um, whether you sense, and this might be just, you might only be able to answer anecdotally, but do you sense a shift in food culture in Egypt to suggest that there was in an increased consumption of bread? And the reason they ask is because they write that when I was working in Southern Morocco, many individuals discussed a shift from eating more porridge, couscous and soups in the past to families today consuming much more bread. So it sounds like in Southern Morocco, there's a sense that people are now eating more than in the past. Mm -hmm. um, do you sense that in what you have seen or what people have told you in Egypt? I don't sense that so much, but I think more what the shift will be is, you know, in terms of, you know, how that, that question was, uh, you know, referred to like people referring to that from their childhood or so sort of over the generation or within the familial memory. I think probably the biggest shift in Egypt would be a shift from in the uh, corn-based spreads to almost, you know, a much higher dominance of wheat-based spreads. So, uh, you know, certainly around rural Egypt at the sort of, in the early part of the 20th century, more people would have eaten breads that were made with corn uh, rather than just wheat flour. Um, so that would be like one shift, but I, I didn't really hear many people talk about eating, uh, you know, a, a meal being replaced like that, um, with bread. Yeah, I wondered about that. And I've been wondering about that with regard to Sudan, because in Sudan, people historically ate a lot of sorghum. And mm -hmm. then there was an increase of wheat consumption from the mid 20th century, more products like macaroni, you know, processed wheat products. But there were still these traditional breads that people were making with sorghum. And at one point in your book, you mentioned that in some of the rural areas in Egypt, people were also adding sorghum to mm -hmm. some of their breads. But yeah, it will be interesting to see if with the sh shift to more water, um, you know, water, what's the word? Crops that use less water, uh, whether there might be that kind of uh, return to more sorghum and the fluctuations that we're likely to see. I don't know. It's just something that's, I'm keeping my eyes open for because I'm intrigued about this question of how much is really changing and how much is the same. And as a historian, it can be difficult to know when that happens, because people don't always, you know, it's not your scholarship is what makes it so new is people haven't really paid that much such close attention to bread as um, as a means of tracking a whole bunch of political and social changes over time. Mm -hmm. That's what also adds makes your again, your study so feel so fresh and original. Um, so Taha Kaleem asks. How do you think the price of bread affects instances of protest in Egypt? In other words, might there be, do you sense, have you seen any correlations between pricing and protest? And they say, I'm thinking of Chantal Berman's work in Tunisia and Morocco. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not familiar with that specific work off, off the top of my head. Um, you know, I think, it's complicated. It's complicated. I mean, I haven't done a kind of, um, it's complicated. You know, back in 1977, as I say, there were protests and the government had increased the price of one bread, but it wasn't the baladi bread. It wasn't the most highly consumed bread. It was this fino bread that was, it's more of a kind of treat bread anyway. So there were protests. Yes, there were protests. Was there an increase in price of bread? Yes, there was, but not of the bread that actually most people were eating. Plus, there were all these other things going on. People's wages were being cut, other subsidies were being cut. So as a lot of the scholarship on bread rights has really, has really sort of demonstrated, um, you know, it, it's too simplistic to say prices go up, people will riot. That's too simplistic a, a kind of story. Um, and certainly, you know, the government has managed, to, did manage to increase the price of bread over the course of the kind of, post-war period through to 1989, and there weren't big protests. So um, I think we have to be wary of um, kind of too simplistic explanations, but at the same time, give credit to the fact that I think that is a palpable concern of policymakers. Great. Um, a couple of more questions, but I want to interject. Uh, there's an article that I love. It reminds me of your book, but it was based on field work from the mid-1980s in Algeria, mm 
by the Dutch anthropologist Willie Janssen. And she discusses, among other things, and it reminds me of the discussion of the Fino versus the Bella di bread, the different symbolic values attached to different kinds of bread. I just wanted to mention that because it's mm -hmm. a study that underlines some of what you're saying. And she also, um, she discussed how people treated different kinds of bread differently. So French baguettes, people would be more inclined to throw away the leftovers, but the local bread, they didn't throw away. They treated it with reverence. And if there was leftovers, they always fed it to the livestock. And going back to the point you raised before, I just want to this thinking about that, our conversation about waste, whether some people might say feeding it to livestock, is that waste or not? She would argue it wasn't, that people regarded that as a legitimate and appropriate, one appropriate use for the leftovers and a way of respecting the bread. So again, that I think that ties in with one of the cool things about your book is your attention to the symbolic resonance of bread on mm -hmm. many different scales and in many different ways. And I just wanted to mention that because it's just this, I never thought about that before. Um, and then your book also brings that out about how the different ways that people think about it. Um, so mm -hmm. I just, yeah, just tossing that out there. Um, one uh, person in, in the audience has asked um, whether you have any thoughts on the strategy for sustainable agricultural development in regard to food security in Egypt. Uh, the, uh, sorry, strategy for sustainable agricultural development to 2030. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that plan um, or that policy statement, but um, any maybe you could use this as an opportunity to discuss any to connect your research to these con ongoing concerns about food security in Egypt. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I have seen that report, but it's been a while since I looked at it, so I'm not sure I can remember the specifics. I mean, one of the interesting things going on in Egypt at the moment, which also has a long history, but has been really kind of promoted again by um, Sisi's government, has been these goals towards expanding the cultivated area. Um, so this, again, it does have this longer history and interest in reclaiming the desert to grow new crops. But one of the, the things that's a little bit different in some of these new efforts is that they are actually very, you know, quite tied to these questions of food security and wheat production. So of much of the earlier waves of reclamation, they were about growing sort of, it was about money, about growing export early season strawberries that you could export to Europe, for example. Um, but, you know, in a lot of the rhetoric around some of the current reclamation efforts, it is tied to producing more wheat for our food security imperative. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing to follow. And it's interesting to think about it in that framework of sustainability, because, um, you know, that is a definitely a sort of key concern when it comes to these reclamation initiatives um, that all rely, well, some draw on groundwater, but that's a, a, a finite source because it's not being replenished and others rely on diverting, you know, more water from the Nile. So that's the, the questions of sustainability are kind of the ones that come up to my mind first when I think about those, those projects for agricultural expansion for um, questions of food security. Um, Reem Talhuk has a follow-up question asking, um, would you say that the delineation between state and society, citizens, individuals, uh, is clear when it comes to subsidies of bread, or does it include a complex web of actors? And that makes me wonder about what you were talking about with regard to farmers and bakers and owners of bakeries and things. If you, if we think about the system of bread supply in Egypt, is it state and citizens, or who, who are the intermediary groups in the arrangement that you see as being really important players in this story? Yeah, no, that's a nice uh, clarification. The, 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 the question has kind of provided us. No, absolutely. Obviously, it's a complex web of actors. And within, you know, if we think, you know, within that sort of state bureaucracy, obviously, people out there are a lot of different perspectives on this. Um, and that's something that I've always tried to sort of draw out in my in my work. Um, and the bakeries that produce the government subsidized bread in Egypt are actually privately owned. So it, that's quite interesting. It's a kind of complex space that, you, you know, that they have to have a, a, a permit from the government to sell subsidized bread. They work with the government to get reimbursed, but they are privately owned. Um, but what is sort of interesting is that when people, though, if people are upset with the quality of the bread, you know, there might be some kind of talking about, well, that baker's not good, but often the state is blamed. The state in a kind of amorphous fashion 
which we all know isn't quite kind of accurate, but is often sort of blamed. So it's, it's interesting, those kind of fuzzy boundaries. Um, you know, another key actor that I talk about that I'd never really thought about before starting this project is all the people who are involved in wheat storage. So that's a huge part of food security that, I, yeah, I really hadn't kind of contemplated, but actually the logistics of managing this grain subsidized, this bread program, you know, the harvest comes in at once a year from the Egyptian farmers, they buy some of it, um, but they have to sort of maintain the supply of bread consistently throughout the year. So storage and silo operators are a really key part of this story too, as well as another private actor, the traders who are the ones who actually bring the, well, actually that's shifted a little bit in the last couple of years, but when I was doing research, they often acted as kind of intermediaries between the government getting the wheat and, and a foreign seller. So there are many different both state and non-state actors that uh, that are involved, um, and absolutely, it's a it's a kind of complex web of web. You know that reminds me of something in your book. You have a discussion. I forget which chapter it's in about this incident whereby somebody advertised um, Russian wheat for sale on Craigslist. You have you discuss, and then there was the suspicion that it was, or maybe the the description of it said it was slightly rotten or moldy. And that created all kinds of anxieties. Where, how is this wheat? Who's selling this wheat? How is it getting into Egypt? Why is it moldy? Who can eat moldy wheat? And that I think relates to the issue of storage mm -hmm. and not just and food security in the sense of not just having wheat in the silos, but having wheat that's safe to eat. And who who's maintaining the integrity of the wheat supply on those two different scales, right? Yeah. And the government's been investing a lot in the storage. And I suppose also another actor to add to that is also the international dimension too. So a lot of the storage facilities have been funded by Gulf countries or other forms of international funding. They're often built by international companies like um, a big um, European company sort of built a lot of silos. So, so there are international parties in at play too. Great. Um, Lena Ghanem has a question on a different um, uh, track. Is there a religious significance to bread in Egypt? Does it differ between Copts and Muslims, for instance? In my own Palestinian Orthodox Christian background, throwing bread away is considered sinful because of its association with divine liturgy and the body of Christ. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't have a detailed answer on that, except that it, it carries religious significance across a number of religions. And um, yes, I think that, you know, there are talking, you know, that maybe some people know Sophia Samantopoulou Robbins' work on um, waste in Palestine. She has a fantastic chapter in her book that's all about why people don't throw away bread, actually, that they kind of gift it, put it in an outdoor space as a way of passing it on to others because it's considered haram to, to throw it away. So, yes, I think there is there is a religious element to the symbolism and to the significance that does shape how people interact with it or there are sayings like you know you would never step on a piece of bread so if people sort of found a, even a little piece that no one's going to eat on the ground people would pick it up or put it at a space where it isn't going to be um, stepped on in the, you know our, our time is going to be winding down so i want to pose a question that andrew simon uh posted much earlier which is um, asking about your thoughts on the future of food studies in Middle Eastern scholarship. He mentioned um, the Martinez book on bread, but I, I would like to broaden that and ask you, how do you see your scholarship? What are the different audiences that you're seeking to reach and to appeal to? You yourself are an anthropologist by training, um, but you know there are aspects of your book that would appeal to historians of science. Um, then there's the food studies community. Who do you want to reach? Where do you see your scholarship going or reaching? And how do you think you're adding to different um, converse, scholarly conversations? Yeah, yeah. So I come to this project not really from a food studies background. Um, you know, I, ne I never set out sort of thinking I'd write a book about bread at some point in my life. Um, but I do think food is, you know, food is such a great prism through which to talk about all sorts of interesting things. Um, so I think a food related, you know, analysis can reach a lot of different 
you know, it can speak to all these different audiences. And that's what I, I definitely hope that this book will be of interest beyond people who just work on work on food. Um, and like you say, I come from a kind of interdisciplinary background and I really was approaching this more from the kind of environmental angle. Um, but as well, I mean, I think there's a lot of scope, you know, for more studies on these related issues in the Middle East. And, you know, hopefully we'll see some great books coming out in your series uh, that you're editing because it, there's there's been a flurry recently. I mean, it just happens, you know, that Jose and my book, Some Bread, came out in the same year. But um, there, there is actually a sort of flurry at the moment or um, which is exciting. There's a, a longer history. Obviously, we're not the first people to write about about food, of course, but um, it's exciting to see some of this scholarship coming out. Yeah, and I think the way you're writing about it is new, and 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 recognizing that you are there are so many different angles. We could see that in a lot of the questions coming up. There are so many different ways of approaching that health, um, religion, as well as the economy, political stability. So many different international relations thinking of Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, Amy Singer had a follow-up question. I th think people will be intrigued to hear about these intermediate actors as nodes in this system. She asked, if they're private, are they an additional layer of subsidy? That is, are they willing to sustain short-term losses for the sake of political stability? Is this a significant change from, say, 30 years ago? Does it make the entire system more fragile? To Amy's question, I, was at, I would add that in your comments in response to the last question about the intermediaries, when you mentioned the European firms that just build silos, it reminded me of discussions about waste management in Egypt today and in the sanitation sector and the importance of Italian companies. Mm. And so we're not really maybe thinking of some of these other actors like the manufacturers of, of wheat you know, storage units mm -hmm. as being part of this story. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so so many actors and then, you know, outside aid organizations or the United Nations and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's a really complicated story. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, any further thoughts that you have on these intermediary actors? I mean, I think it's 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 a complicated relationship because they do, um, you know, they, they provide a valuable you know, if you think of like the silo operators, some silos are operated privately and sometimes they're storing other kinds of wheat that's being used for cakes and things, but sometimes they're contracted by the government to store some of its wheat. So, you know, they do provide a valuable, um, you know, they, they provide a value component. You know, there are some private, like large scale agri firms, agribusiness that are growing wheat on a large scale that most of which they sell, you know, because they're not providing for their families. They are, they, they sell it so that's kind of quite a kind of that's a, a valuable component that it's, it's really dwarfed by the small scale farmers so they they provide value but they have different interests and I think that's what's important to pull out you know they are involved to make money and those traders who are bringing wheat from overseas are involved to make money and so that does produce these um tensions at certain points um, and I tell one story I tell in the book is about these conflicts over the about questions of the quality of imported wheat. And that really, that case really, it was a case around a fungus called ergot. And the case really brought to light some of these different perspectives between those who just wanted to bring wheat into the country really to, to for their money, for their monetary kind of value. And then um, different government officials who were really kind of concerned with exactly what grain they're bringing in and whether it could foster, you know, could, could, bring in harmful disease with it. So, um, yeah. Great. As we uh, move towards wrapping up, and I see Nader is coming on to, to tell me that it's almost time to wrap up. Do you, is are there things that you think we should look for, uh, look ahead and expect, things that you see on the horizon with the story that you set out in your book that we should be looking out for? And then um, do you have exciting plans ahead that you'd like to tell us about what, what's next for you? in this line of scholarship? Um, I mean, I think one thing that would be really fascinating to keep an eye on is whether, whether, or maybe it's a question of when, I'm not sure, is, is whether the government will change this price of bread that has been held stable since 1989 and what happens when it does. I, I should think it probably will at some point. So that will be really fascinating to watch for and see what happens, if anything. Um, 
So that's probably my main thing I'd be I'd be watching for. And then in terms of my own research, I you know I maintain my interest in the Middle East, but actually I'm currently doing research in London for a slightly different um, project that's about air. Uh, so I studied water and then bread, and now I'm thinking about a gas, um, and it's about questions of air quality and sort of people's lived experience in London. Wow, that sounds really cool. So th thank you. Anyway, I will turn it back to our hosts at Brandeis and say okay. what an honor it has been for me to participate in this discussion. And again, how much I love your book. And thank I look so forward much. to reading your next work on air, air quality. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. I think it's it was really an honor for us that you've both agreed to participate in this seminar. And I also like to uh, say a special thanks to my colleague, uh, Karen Shapira, who um, really managed all of these and made this seminar possible behind the scene. Um, um, if we were not able to answer any of your questions uh, today, uh, we are going to send all of the questions to Heather and Jessica, and they might uh, choose to respond to you directly in the in the future. Um, also, we look forward to seeing you at our next seminar, which is going to be on March 6th. Uh, our guest uh, for that seminar is former US ambassador to Israel and Egypt, Daniel Kurtzer. Uh, he would be joined by my colleague, Shai Feldman, and they will discuss the fallout from the Israel Hamas war. Again, thank you everyone on behalf of the Crown Center. And I would like to say, have a wonderful evening, wonderful afternoon or wonderful morning, wherever you are on our beautiful planet. Thank you very much. <laughs>